School psychologists are probably most likely to use uh, the information in the AAIDD definition manual, probably more so than, than any other set of professionals, uh, because it's their role to assess to determine eligibility for special education services and eligibility for the diagnosis of intellectual disability. Um, so the initial core chapters in the manual address diagnosis. They address first how the definition is applied um, and what IQ and adaptive behavior measures um, are used uh, and how, how they are used and how the measurement results are interpreted and understood um, and provide some very in-depth guidelines for clinical psychologists to apply in determining if a diagnosis of intellectual disability is appropriate or not. Um, and these, uh, the, these chapters are particularly important. Uh, it's not like they address things that have not been addressed in prior manuals, but I think what's relevant is that they update what we know about diagnosis um, and they update it so that uh, the points that are included are, are the most accurate. The way that special education students are grouped is very much influenced by the definition of the disability. Um, in particular, with intellectual disability, traditionally what we have done is to sort students by their IQ level. We've also identified teachers and matched teachers trained to work with certain IQ levels to classrooms. And this traditional approach has had some pretty bad effects on separation, um, or bad effects on inclusion. Uh, so students with intellectual disability have been separated from their peers who have no disabilities far more often than any other disability group. The current manual challenges that approach by having educational teams uh, work, to, I, work through five steps to try to identify a, a program that will support students. Um, and it also purposefully emphasizes the importance of inclusion, supported inclusion of students. Well, one thing that happened was we pretty much said, stop using mild, moderate, severe, profound. Do not do that anymore. You know, don't classify kids by their IQ scores. And uh, to the extent that we said that because we saw what happened in schools. We saw that kids were being sorted out into groups and the ones at the mild and moderate, it depended on how much we said they, we would predict they could learn. There are multiple ways you can classify individuals with disabilities. You just need to have a purpose to do it. Um, and if your purpose is research and your purpose is to describe by adaptive behavior levels, by support levels, or even by IQ levels, fine. That's legitimate purpose. But to let IQ levels uh, dictate classrooms, separation, you know, predictions of what people can and can't learn, that's a mistake. If you provide an individual with the supports that they actually need to achieve outcomes, um, the focus is on what they can learn and what they can do, rather than focusing on numbers of IQ points mean you can't do this and you'll be unable to do that. Uh, and I think that turnaround um, is now widely accepted. The current manual provides a five component process for educational teams to identify goals, to assess supports, to plan intervention, to monitor, and to evaluate intervention. This five step process takes a lot of time and energy, um, but it's one that, that allows the student with intellectual disability to get the kinds of supports that they, that they actually need. So the first step, which is one that teams unfortunately rarely do, um, is often referred to as person-centered planning. Um, 
It also could involve what we call an ecological inventory. But the bottom line of this first step is that we are assessing needed and desired and valued goals and life experiences. The second step involves um, assessing the supports a person needs in order to reach or achieve those goals. The third step's a little more familiar. It's writing an IEP. Um, and at this step, the parent, parent and team members need to try to prioritize what's the most important. They need to identify the methods, the procedures, the locations, the adaptations, um, and implement a program. The next step is monitoring, uh, see if progress is happening, and finally evaluating the outcomes. So this five-step process is one um, that doesn't have to happen in a special ed classroom. S supports are portable. Uh, and in the past, I think we've relied way too much on saying you can only get supports if you're in a special ed classroom. So the, this particular manual provides um, a lot more detail on this process, and it's very helpful to teachers.